Welcome back to another episode of 40 Facts About the 40K Universe. I am your host, Gershwan, and today we're going to be talking about the bodyguards of an Archon. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. We post Warhammer 40K lore videos every single day. If you have any suggestions for other Dark Eldar lore, please comment down in the comment section below. And if you enjoy our content, thank our patrons on Patreon. It's because of them that we can do this. Link in the description if you guys want to support us. But with that said, let's get into 40 facts on the most common bodyguards of an Archon. The leaders of the Drukhari Cabal are one of the most powerful and influential Dark Eldar within the dark city of Kamara and its many satellite domains. But the incredible power also paints a bullseye on each Archon's back, and every Cabalite Lord must surround himself with a strong and loyal retinue to protect himself from the constant coup and assassination attempts. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the worst bodyguard an Archon can have is one of his own kin. Dark Eldar are innately egotistical and follow their own self-interest. Treachery is an inevitability when dealing with their own kind. However, there is one Drukhari a Dark Lord can't help but accept into his retinue. They are known as Lamaeans. A Lamaean is a female Drukhari warrior who not only acts as a guardian to an Archon, but also an imaginative and passionate lover. Outside of the bedroom, the Lamaeans are members of the Sisterhood of Lilithu and devote themselves to the study of poisons, drugs, toxins, and other methods of killing with stealth and misdirection. They are considered to be amongst the foremost poisoners in the dark city of Kamara, an accomplishment as impressive as it is sinister. The Lamaeans revere the mysterious figure known as Shymash, father of poisons. It is unclear if this is a mythological figure in the Dark Eldar mythos or a real-life historical figure. The tendency of Adari mythic cycles to blur the line between the two has not helped what studies exist on the topic. Whether this Shamesh was real or not, his influence lives on in the deadly bruise of his devoted followers. Such is the Sisterhood's mastery that they can alter the poisons of others to enhance their effects, intuitively knowing how to best maximize the weapon's potency with a simple glance. It is no surprise that the average Lamaean wields a Shamashi blade. These deadly weapons can be anything from an elegant short sword curved dagger, or even a barbed hairpin. The core of each weapon is shot through with reservoirs of breathtaking lethal poisons, while its surface is riddled with microscopic vents through which these venoms can flow. With each graceful swing or lightning fast stab, it parts flesh to vent its poisons where they can do the most harm. There are even rumors that say even a kiss blown upon the wind by a Lamaean courtesan can kill hundreds in its deadly path. An Archon's retinue can also consist of a variety of Xeno races, but the most common is a sentient reptilian creature known as a Slith. Slith are highly intelligent Xenos that can be best described as having a snake-like lower body and a vaguely humanoid torso, but possess multiple arms and a serpentine head. This Xenos has two pairs of strong arms, which work independently of one another, meaning that a Slith has a great deal of dexterity and can even use multiple weapons at the same time. Slith are hairless and covered with thick scales, and while their head is vaguely human, there is no visible signs of ears outside of small holes on each side of the slit's head. The creature has large, wide-set eyes, and instead of a nose, it has a pair of nasal pits. The slit's lipless mouth holds a set of huge fangs that protrude from its upper jaw, along with a host of smaller, sharpened teeth. A thin forked tongue flickers from its mouth, constantly tasting the air for prey. The senses of a slith are overall quite advanced, displaying a far better sense of smell than a human's, but with less developed hearing. The slith's lower body provides locomotion with wide flat scales that allow the creature to grip the ground and pull itself along. They can move quickly and with good speed over most terrain, and their multiple arms along with their lengthy torso allow them to climb rapidly when needed. The scales are larger on its back and side, and the roughly textured arms host strong hands able to easily crush a man's head. Imperial scholars don't know how the Slith became the Archon's most popular Xeno bodyguard. Some speculate that the monster settled in the lower levels of Kamara as a means to escape she who thirsts. Others claim that the dull-witted creatures were presumably chosen by the Dark Eldar as they were easy to exploit and ferocious in battle. One question about the Slith, the Eldari do not discuss them or any bargain that they've made with them. Some more infamous Imperial trader captains have even been reported to trying to hire a Slith as a mercenary. But as far as anyone knows, none have been successful. The Slith would make excellent hired fighters if such a bargain could ever be struck, as they are tenacious in combat, seemingly able to disregard enemy distractions as they go about their duty. 
Many Imperial explorers hold that this could be a result of conditioning programs implanted by their masters, but others who have watched the creature in action hold their behavior more resembles that of a crazed addict to fall into their access to mark what is happening around them. The Slith have been found on several different planets and regions in the galaxy, usually in small packs of no more than six, but occasionally large groups have been sighted as well. If they are seen with any technology, it is always of another species make. There are also no records of actual Slith voidcrafts either, and many xenologists hold that Slith can only travel through the stars at the whims of their Archon employers. Imperial storytellers say that the Slith came from an ancient Xeno culture that fell to darkness long ago. Then again, this is a common way to speak of almost every Xeno race in the unlawful regions of space. As a matter of fact, some speak of the Slith in the same breath as the Rakol, and whisper their name alongside such foul things as the Yuvoth, but this would only seem as an aggressive assessment of the threat they possess. The most important characteristic in Archon values of the Slith is their extreme loyalty. Some accounts have them fiercely holding ground to allow their masters to safely escape a conflict. Another one of the Archon's most dangerous bodyguards is a Urgul. The Urgul is a lanky, carnivorous humanoid Xenos that is a superlative tracker and hunter. They are native to the labyrinthian ziggurats of the Dark Eldar city of Shadome, a satellite realm of the dark city of Kamara in the webway. The musculature and basic physiology of the creature definitely points towards the blessed form of humanity, but that is where the similarities end. The Xeno's skin is incredibly resistant to damage, almost as hard as iron. Its hands and feet carry wicked claws, which it uses to rapidly grab onto the incapacitated prey. Reports indicate that it has an astounding dexterity, able to move with almost unnatural grace and quickness. Several Calixian Beast House records even contain rumors that the Urgol has the ability to escape bonds and cells by twisting and contorting its body in an unwholesome way. These abilities, when added together, make the Xenos a terrifying creature when it comes into combat. The beast's head, however, contains the secrets of what makes it such a superb predator. The face of a Urgol is something that few could forget. The somewhat flat visage is deeply cut by a wide, thin mouth filled with needle-like teeth. The thick, muscular tongue is long and can be extended far beyond the thin lips. It is also particularly sensitive, able to sense another creature many meters away simply by tasting the prey sweat and breath in the air. Above the mouth sits a series of carnivorous sense pits instead of single noses or eyes. These pits extend far into the skull, creating large sensory regions. Accordingly, the nostrils are extraordinarily acute and can pick up not only airborne scents, but also detect heat emanations, air vibrations, and some say even warp disturbances. The Urgul is a very effective hunter, despite its lack of any discernible vision senses, able to track its quarry for kilometers using an easy looping gait that covers long distances with low effort. It can keep such a pace for long durations, waiting for the right time to finish off its prey. Once it is ready, the Urgol's speed is unnatural. It rapidly becomes a fury of claws and teeth as it tears its prey into goblets of flesh and often begins to feed while its victim is still alive. Once in the state of a frenzied feeding, this viciousness makes it a very hard creature to stop. A few who have survived such encounters claim that they have pried the jaws of the dead Urgol off its still struggling victim, as the ferocious mandibles would not go slack even in death. Such is the terrible essence of the Urgol, for nothing can stay its unrelenting nature, not even death. The Urgol appears to be an omnivorous humanoid with pack tendencies, certainly suitable to fill an ecological niche on many planets. It has been sighted multiple times throughout the ragged worlds, suggesting an origin somewhere amongst the isolated region. It has also been firmly documented to exist on no less than five other planets from other regions in the Coronis Expanse. While the theory of parallel evolution is somewhat accepted by most branches of the Adeptus Mechanicus Magobiologus, to have such a creature evolve on so many different planets with different climates and ecologies seem to suggest transportation rather than evolution.
Who or what is behind such transportation is a basis for much speculation, especially as to what possible motivations could be directing such efforts. A few radical Xeno savants have even suggested that the Dark Eldar raiders have some powerful and secret link to the Orgal, now found on several worlds in the Expanse. One ancient report found in the depths of Hive Syllabus in the Calixis sector makes mention of the Orgol's original homeworld, is called Shadom, but does not mention what system or even sector of the galaxy this world occupies. Several more adventurous explorers and xenographers have searched for this planet, but as of yet, none have been located. More disturbingly, few of these missions have returned at all. It is due to the erroneous data concerning the world's location, or whatever was awaiting those questing after the Orgo is yet another mystery concerning the species from the Immaterium. Taproom tales of Port Wander tell that these things have been seen in close proximity to Dark Eldar pirates and raiding parties, used as some kind of tracking hound. Those who have survived some of these Xenos raids have even spoken of seeing creatures whose features resemble the Orgol taking a part in the attack. They have been used to hunt down those who sought to escape the raiders, fleeing away in a frantic attempt to reach safety or hiding places where they could wait until the Xenos departed. The attempts were doomed to fail. The Orgols were set loose to roam the area and soon caught the scent of desperation and fear left in the air. In each report, none escaped the beast that their prey was dragged weeping and screaming back to the Xenos raiders to meet their terrible fates. One unverified but popular account relates that a particular high-ranking member of the enigmatic Xenos race personally commanded one such beast, using it as a part of a vile blood sport raid and other foul practices. The story says that the Xenos employed the beast to track down a human the Dark Eldars believed have wronged him in some unfathomable way. It managed to track down the unfortunate prey across the varied surface of Jantos III, deep within the unbeholden reaches, a world known for its bleak rocky plains and pestilent marshlands. The hunt went on for solar weeks, ranging far across broad swaths of a remote and scantily inhabited continent. But finally, the Urgar caught up with its victim, who did not long survive the debt he had to pay. The cruel Xenos directing the beast seemed to delight as much with the hunt as it did with the method of payment. Such thoughts are likely just so much fancy, mere void traveler stories, to frighten parties or to put fear in their trading associates' dreams. Some Xeno savants worry that being able to command such terrible beasts is perhaps even more possible than previously believed. It is definite that as mindless hunters, the Urgal are certainly dangerous enough. If actually under the direction of a sentient Xenos race, as sadistic and intelligent as the Dark Eldar, their threat level can only increase. The final Xeno bodyguard that we will discuss is a Medusae but many eclectic Archons can maintain all manner of deadly Xeno creatures in their cords, from worm-like haymovers to great shade ravens whose croak and caw drive those who hear it insane. A Medusa is an invertebrate parasitic organism that resides within the Eldar webway. The true horror of the Medusa is not due to the creature itself, for while it is clearly an unnatural creature, it does not seem to possess any direct threat. A Medusa's main body is no more than a bag of flesh, not much larger than a human head. The flesh itself is not unusual, except for the fact that it carries a high concentration of neural pathways and receptors. Some theorize that this unusual neurology resembles the brain of a sentient species, but most knowledgeable biologists wave off such thoughts. Its eerie hovering is perhaps the most disturbing feature. While several savants have studied the creature, none can determine how it floats effortlessly without any visible means of propulsion. While the Medusa has no limbs, it does have a surprising number of thin, whip-like tentacles, numbering in the dozens. They seem to look like bare spinal cords, free of any bones. This is not so far from the truth, as the Medusa's main form of attack seems to be inserting these tentacles into the brain and nervous system of a creature and melding with it. The Medusa has somehow become the ultimate parasite. It does not just live off the vital fluids or flesh of its host, it actually becomes one with it. 
The medusae's unique neural structure allows the phalzinos to insert itself into the mind of its host and take over the host's body, all the while allowing the host to remember and feel everything. Those few victims who have survived an encounter with the medusae tell tales of feeling as if they can take in all of the emotions around them with exceptional clarity. Others have mentioned that they felt as if they were storing the emotion, intensifying it and holding onto it like an obscene sponge. Even worse are those attempting to rescue their victimized comrades from the creature, as they are often struck senseless by overpowering waves of powerful anguish, seemingly emitting from the very eyes of those they would save. Along the side of its body are also a series of thick tentacles, often sprouting larger growths. These growths form in a series of ploin-sized tubers, folding over one another like a cluster of ripe fruit. The body of the medusae seems to have no need for these growths, and they appear to be completely extraneous to the medusae itself. There are even reports of these growths coming off the medusae during an attack without causing the creature any harm, like the tail of a lizard. It has been noted, however, that as the creature attacks and uses its host, these growths seem to enlarge and new tubers seem to form. Studies of these growths have been inconclusive though this has not prevented cold traders from doing a brisk business in them. They feature in tales of sordid gatherings where the debauched and debased dare each other to actually consume these growths. Even the smallest nibble is enough to send these foolish cads into paroxysms of either agony or ecstasy, it being difficult to tell the difference in their faces. The experience is too much for even these jaded degenerates as they collapse into coma-like states their brains unable to process such intense emotional power. Most gossip says that none have ever recovered, but this has not stopped others from such temptations, such as the reputation for the experience. Scholars of Xenos in the Coronis Expanse are foiled by what little information there is about these creatures and how contradictory their reports appear to be. This has hindered efforts to pin down their homeworld, and many hold that they are not native to the Expanse. The creatures do not seem to favor any one climate, and other than their attack upon victim sentience, they do not seem to require any substance, assuming this attack is indeed needed for survival. They have been sighted in the company of Dark Eldar raiders, launched onto what appears to be slave cast beings, leaving some to believe that the creatures could be pets or even a food source for this race. These visor-slaved beings are utilized by Archons to record the roiling emotions of the battlefield. In battle, Medusae shuffle forth at their master's behest, foul parasitic flesh sacks bobbing in their wake as their visors spew nauseous anti-light that hurls foes into contrapathic comas. Some psychers have also provided accounts saying that they have encountered Medusae while in the state of a dreamlike meditation, but the very nature of these reports make them dubious at best. What's cool about the lore of the bodyguards of a Drukhari Archon is that you can pretty much have anything. Um, the Archons can bring in slaves or take children and raise them as their own and make them bodyguards. So uh, what I would recommend is jumping over to Blackstone Fortress, getting one of those models, because every single model from Blackstone Fortress can be carried over to um, 40k, uh, and actually using one of those uh, special figures uh, within your 40k game. Uh, so you do have that option. Those were the 40 facts of the bodyguards of the Drukhari Archons. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you like our content, uh, thank our patrons on Patreon. It is because of them that we can do this. Link in the description if you guys want to support us. It's just a dollar a month. If not, liking, commenting, and sharing helps out the channel a lot. So thank you guys for listening, and I will talk to you tomorrow. This was Gersh1 with One Mind Syndicate signing out. <laughs>